After the Apocalypse, a pandemic survival story, presents episode one of a new short series of stories written by Chris Mad Dog Russell, that's me, and read with post-production by Mike Makeshift Darling, our old friend Mike. So welcome to this experimental story series we're having fun with during the break between seasons, and the working title is Alien Schizoid. And we hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned after the story, and I'll come back with some follow-up thoughts and updates and some stories about that intro music. <laughs> and to take you out. So here's Makeshift. This is Mike Darling from the Apocalypse Post. I'll be narrating today's episode. Chris ran a narration contest last year, and I won. You can find my work at MikeDarlingFilms.com, and don't forget to check out my original post-apocalyptic anthology series, Legends of Wasteland City. Find it wherever you get your pods. Without further ado, please enjoy Alien Schizoid. Chapter 1. Head Bashing. The bathroom fan screamed a tired airplane sound that was entirely out of place for the lack of airflow it produced, but entirely consistent with the dismal nature of this motel. He wiped blood from his face with a threadbare hotel towel and looked in the hollow, soulless pits where his eyes should have been. It was happening again. Jim thought he had beaten it. All the medication... All the years of grown-up therapy with smart and sympathetic doctors. He really thought he had beaten it, but now a new strident voice had erupted in his mind. Somehow different. Before, the voices were shadowy ghosts of things, just at the edge of his conscious thought. Not even voices, really. More like thoughts that weren't entirely his. Before, the thoughts were more like unwanted noise cluttering his mind. The voice had its own narrative. It was distinct and seemed more real than before. The new voice seemed closer, more fully formed, a frightful intruder that pressed to take over. That difference terrified him. And here he was, cowering in an unnamed motel in the worst part of town, to hide from this new break, to escape from his co-workers, to protect his family from the voice. Even as a kid, he'd known he was at risk. They had institutionalized his mom when he was still young. They told him these things ran in families, that he might have the same broken wiring inside of him. It was why he was ready when the first shadows started to appear. When he hit puberty and the chemistry in his body changed, he had seen the edges of his mind begin to fray. He'd been quick to ask for help. They were able to catch it early and with this intervention to treat him. To give him back, if not his life, then a life. A life with a slightly dulled and muffled mind, but a life better than the terrifying breaks with the reality he'd begun to experience. He was still grateful for that. He had survived. He had thrived in his way. A college degree, a normal job at the insurance agency and miracle of miracles, a wife and a family. He was grateful every day for that normalcy. It might be a shaved and muddled existence that throttled his true self in ways, but it was better than the hell of losing self altogether. But now this voice was here to take it all away. The day had started out as normal as any other, better than most, actually. He was to attend a company awards ceremony. He optimistically wore a clean and pressed blue shirt with a conservative black tie. He shined his shoes and had on his newest pair of khaki slacks, ironed and creased. The presentation was all Jim had imagined. He received his certificate for best attendance and held it proudly as he reveled in the polite applause of his workmates. But as he made his way back to his seat, a glow in a refreshing flush of normalcy a voice, the voice, interrupted. Hey, pal. 
it had said brightly in his mind like a ringing bell. We need to talk. The clarity and force of the voice startled him. It made him stumble a bit. He tried to hold the fake smile as emotions and fear ripped at him. Maybe it was the emotion of the moment. Maybe it was something he had eaten that had somehow thrown his chemistry off. Maybe he had somehow screwed up his meds. Perhaps the adrenaline rush of the applause in the crowded banquet hall had overwhelmed the delicate balance of the neurochemical inhibitors. Or maybe, just maybe, that awful fracture of his mind that he'd been diligently holding off had begun anew. Some Rubicon moment had passed and the thing he feared most had found him. The cracks in his fragile mind had fissured and he was dropping into the abyss. When the voice began, he was terrified, but in some sense, also not surprised. He'd been warned of this. He had lived his life on tender hooks in anticipation of this moment. Jim smiled grimly around his fear and excused himself to his co-workers. Maybe they noticed the blood draining from his face and the sweat on his brow. Would they just assume it was food poisoning or the flu? Surely they could suspect nothing else from this milk-toast fella who never caused any trouble. In a panic, he rushed from the building and away from them, away from that bastion of normalcy. Where should he go? Was there anyone he could turn to for help? His family? No, he would not risk burdening his wife and children with this break. His doctors or the hospital? No, they would call his wife and maybe even his work. No, he had worked too hard to earn this life. He would not put those he loved at risk. First, he would find someplace safe and rest. He needed quiet. He needed refuge. He would set his phone for a few hours of do not disturb. Some place where no one could possibly know him. Somewhere where no one would ask questions or notice a freak with voices in his head. He would give it some time to see if it stopped by itself, as he knew these episodes often did. Then the rational man in him could make rational decisions about who to turn to for help. Jim gritted his teeth as the voice harangued him with its old-timey rhymes and rhythm. He checked into the cheap motel in the poor part of town and lay down in the lumpy twin bed with a plaid quilt. He needed time to focus, time to remember who he was, time to take control of his thoughts. He willed the voice to stop. He willed silence in his mind. He focused on the normal and rational version of the James that he knew was in there, that had to win out for him to survive. The voice did not stop. The voice questioned him incessantly. It urged him to do things. Not horrible things, just things he couldn't really understand. It reasoned with him. It badgered him. Until finally, after so many hours, he had staggered to the bathroom and looked at himself in the mirror, those hollow and frightened eyes. Oh God, he looked crazy. At that point, hope deserted him and rationality was subsumed by a wave of rage. He began bashing his head into the image of himself on the mirror. Get out! Get out! Get out! He repeated each time his forehead hit the smudged glass. Get out! Get out! Get out! A crack spiraled out from the impact point and the mirror rattled against its mooring screws. A delicate wedge of glass angled out from the cracks and tore his skin. Blood ran down his face and he sobbed. <laughs> But the voice stopped. The voice stopped. A tentative wave of relief flowed over him like a tide rising over a sandbar, erasing footprints and abandoned sandcastles. The voice was gone. The voice was gone. Jim breathed deeply in through his nose and exhaled loudly out his mouth. He grabbed one of the hand towels from the rack and ran water in the sink. He washed away the blood and wiped himself clean. He'd tell them he'd slipped and offer to pay for the broken mirror. Now he could make those calls. To his wife to tell her not to worry. To Dr. Shelley for an assessment and maybe some new meds. To work to tell them he wasn't feeling well and would need a couple days off. So much for my attendance record, he thought. It's going to be all right, he said to himself as he straightened up. I'm still here, and it's going to be all right. He reassured himself 
This was all part of life. The worst had passed, and he'd be back to normal soon enough. James Everwell lay down on the wrinkled coverlet that smelled like mothballs and closed his eyes. He focused on his breath and recited the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. He exhaled deeply allowing the great ball of fear to unwind from his chest. It was going to be all right. And then... Hey, pal, what are you, some kind of jamoke? Smacking yourself in the head for kicks? You look like you got one of them brainworms. Like you went ten rounds with some big palooka. Are you ready to get serious and get to business already? We got more problems than a one-armed paper hanger, and I need your help. <laughs> Jim let out a giggle that grew quickly into a laugh, a maniacal outburst mixed with sobs. He snorted and guffawed at the voice in his head, at the ridiculousness of it all, his half-crazy, half-normal existence, his futile efforts to hang on to a life that most men wouldn't even want. And now this insistent newcomer of a voice cajoling him like a 1930s gangster. He laughed and laughed until the pillow was wet with his tears and drool, and it was somehow cathartic, somehow relieving, somehow comforting. And at last, when the heaving sobs and laughs lost their energy and he was left in the wrinkled sheets breathing and spent, he felt better. He was no longer in the mood to fight. He sighed deeply and gave in to the inevitable. Okay, Jim said out loud to the voice in his head. What do you want? Attaboy, pal. Now you're talking sense. I thought you went slap happy on me. Now, let's stop gold bricking and get to wake. Hello, my survivor friends. Thank you for listening to this first installment of the special story, the Alien MacGuffin Noir series. I'm having a lot of fun writing it. Yes, there is an alien. There will be a MacGuffin. And there will be some noir. I figured you needed a break from the in-between seasons interviews assault I was putting on you there. Although, spoiler alert, I've done two more interviews. Really good ones, actually. A lot of fun. Uh, one for a screenwriting podcast and the other for sort of a literary magazine podcast. And I've got one more scheduled with a guy who does is a sort of superhero comic convention podcast of some sort. Not sure about that one, but I will do my best. I'll bring the energy. So this is my hustle project, all these interviews to get the word out about our fun little show here and why people should come and join the party. So anyhow, today's uh, session is recorded by Mike, and I was blown away by Mike's narration and the little bit of post-production he did with the sound effects on this story. Uh, he did all those effects himself. God love him. He's got a full-time job, and he went down the rabbit hole of this script with me, and he over-delivered, I think. But we'll see going forward. He says he wants to keep doing it. We'll see. I have no idea how long this story arc is. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, I think, I'm, you know, I'm looking at maybe 10,000 words for this, so three or four episodes that we can squeeze in between seasons. Um, I cut this episode at 1,600 or so words to fit Mike's schedule, so really it was kind of a half episode, a bit of an experiment. So I'll keep pushing these out, and we'll see what, what comes of it. And let me know what you think of it. Is it a storyline that's worthy of creating a new show from? Right? I can do that, so let me know. I won't let it interfere with the production of Season 3, though, of After the Apocalypse, but we'll find a way to squeeze it in if uh, it's got legs, because I love it so far. And don't worry, we've got Season 3 queued up, ready to start. We'll start up again in September. Other updates from me in this fine New England summer. I sent the manuscript of Season 1 out to our beta readers to see if we can't draft and craft and hew 
it into something worthy of a book. I printed up some cards for handing out at shows. It has the Season 1 Old Man logo, the white and black, uh, with a black background in the front, and then the ACAST show URL on the back. So our survivor friend Cinnamon, who's decided she's going to cosplay Mags in Denver at the Fan Expo next weekend, and hand them out. So if anyone else wants a stack to hand out at a show, let me know. I'll ship. So those are my show updates. I'll put the links in the show notes. Now let's talk about something more fun. Let's talk about the music clip that I used in the introduction. That was 21st Century Schizoid Man by King Crimson from the 1969 album Court of the Crimson King. And so I get to tell you my King Crimson story. A couple years ago, I was in the Nashville airport, standing in a restaurant line, waiting for a table, and it was at the afternoon rush, and the place was jammed, and I was chatting up the guy in line next to me. When I saw a table open up, and I said to him, come on, let's grab that one, because, you know, we were both singles, so we could grab a table. And I didn't know this guy. He was carrying a guitar case and seemed nice enough. So we grabbed the table, and I asked him what he did. And he said, well, I'm a musician. And he said his name was Adrian. And since I'm not that socially aware on the best of days, I asked, have you done anything or played with anything I might have heard of? And he looks at me rather strangely and says, well, yeah, you know, David Bowie, King Crimson, Frank Zappa, which turned into a socially awkward moment for me. It turns out it was Adrian Bellu, amazing guitarist, virtuoso, who, as he said, played with Bowie, King Crimson, Frank Zappa, Talking Heads, Nine Inch Nails, etc. And I'd like to say the story ends with us becoming best buddies or something like that, but it does not. He had to go catch his flight. I drank my beer and continued on my way as well. But I always liked King Crimson, and now I have another reason to like King Crimson. Who knows? Maybe Adrian might listen to our podcast someday. You never know who you're going to run into in Nashville, in the airport. That's all I have for you this week. Hope you enjoyed the alien MacGuffin noir story. We'll have some more of them and a few more interviews before we dive back into the apocalypse with season three. So enjoy your summer and keep surviving. (laughs) 